Hello, Cyber World. This is Tiger Lily, show host for Tiger Lily's Freedom Roar. Welcome to my first random roar, and it's about my friend Bill Bubert, founder of ZeroGov.com. On Memorial Day of 2011, I attended an Oath Keepers Memorial March to honor the family of former Marine Jose Garena. Jose had been killed a few days before in a botched raid by Pima County, Arizona SWAT. There were several local television reporters there at the march to cover the story. Afterwards, I joined the Oath Keepers and Jose's family for a memorial service. There, Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes introduced several speakers who talked about the need to go back to the constitutional principles that founded the U.S. And then, Stuart introduced Bill Bubert, where I saw him for the first time. What Bill said to that group took guts and made a lasting impression on me for sure. Thanks for checking out my very first random roar. A few weeks ago, we first brought you the case of the shooting of a former two-tour Marine, Jose Garena. A SWAT team in Pima County, Arizona, had targeted, targeted his home as part of a series of drug raids. But before Garena could answer the door, the door was broken in by SWAT. And they saw Garena was holding a rifle, and they proceeded to open fire. He was shot dead in his home after a SWAT team unloaded over 70 times leaving him dead with 60 bullets to the chest. And here's a helmet camera from the actual incident. I'll warn you that what you are about to see is graphic. Now we should note that after he was shot, his wife begged for treatment. Medical professionals weren't allowed into the house for over an hour. Now as for the drug raid, no actual narcotics were found in his home. And his rifle still had the safety engaged. Now after an investigation was launched into the details of this botched raid, it turns out that the SWAT team was cleared of any wrongdoing by the state attorney's office. Mr. Bill Buper, uh, he prefers to be referred to as simply a quiet professional. For those of you know, those, those of you know what that means, know what it means, those of you, those of you don't, too bad. So, Bill Buber. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank uh, Stuart for the honor of me being up here to address this august occasion. And uh, Ms. Goodenner. My heart goes out to you. I have five children that presently have a father. And I'm so sorry for what's happened to you. And I'm ashamed of our country. I'm ashamed of my countrymen. I'm even partially ashamed of the people in this room, but I'll address that later in Hawaii. But our heart goes out to you as a family. What I wanted to talk about today may set some people awry, may make them fill their pants, may not be what you want to hear. But you know this is about tough love because we're in tough times. And the reason I say that is this. I've heard several people before me, remember we can disagree here. Several people before me said, it's the policies, it's not the people. Well that ain't right because human beings execute policies. And by the way, in 1945 during the Nuremberg war trials, those people who were the witnesses and the defendants, they tried that trick. They tried to say, hey, hey, we didn't make the policies. They just gave us the guns and told us where to point them and we pulled the trigger, but we're not responsible for that trigger finger. To which I say, bullshit. <laughs> you want to be a Vichy-style collaborator in Nazi-occupied France from 1940 to 1945? Join the police department and make that excuse. But it doesn't hold anymore. Because right now, we live in a police state. Our country is at war with us. There was a recent Indiana Supreme Court decision in which they said that it is illegal for a human being in their own home to defend themselves against an illegal entry by police or whatever state-supported thugs are out there who are currently coming into your home to do you harm or take your goods. Is that right? No. It flies in the face of 500 years of jurisprudence in the Western world. And the English, by the way, have a duty to retreat. 
They have a duty to run to that cliff, turn around, stop at the cliff, and defend themselves. That is not American jurisprudence. We have never had a duty to retreat. Our duty is our obligation never to initiate aggression. And guess what police departments do on a daily basis? As a matter of fact, ask yourself this question in a thought experiment. Since the founding of this nation, or we can go back to the 16th century, if it weren't for cops and tax collectors, where would our freedom be today? Where would it be? You know exactly where it would be, much farther ahead than it presently is. All these laws that people complain and carp and carry on about, the feet, the meters, the yards, the miles of federal legislation and state legislation that is out there, that is in these dusty tomes that are on the bookshelves that are taken down every now and again to be enforced against us because maybe we sold a tangerine that was below the requisite diameter. Maybe we sold raw milk. Or maybe somebody was coming through the door who didn't clearly identify themselves and we did what every red-blooded American man's gonna do. We grabbed our rifle and we manned up and we stood fast and made sure our family was safe and we were there to take care of business. And what happened? He was gunned down. Why was he gunned down? Because he was being an American man. That's why. It's wrong. It's wrong what's going on across this country. And a large part of what's wrong with what's going on around this country is the fact that we are a police state. Let me take a slight segue here to describe something because words are so important. We have malum prohibitum laws. We have malum per se laws. Malum prohibitive means it's wrong because the government said it's wrong. The tangerines I just mentioned, the raw milk that I just mentioned. Maybe you like to take vitamins. Maybe you like to go shooting in a place that you've chosen. Malum per se laws are rape, initiated aggression, theft, murder, maiming and injury and vandalism. Those are malum per se because I think most everybody in this room can agree that those things are wrong. Can anybody in this room agree that a man defending his home is wrong and that officer safety is not an abridgment of liberty? And like Sheriff Max said, that now we have it that this Praetorian Guard, this thin blue line, that they're more equal than others. Their lives are more valuable than ours. And do you know why? Because they are defenders of the status quo. They are defenders of the government they are the Praetorian Guard. They are the ones who are standing fast with more and more lethal and non-lethal technology and saying, you know what? If you screw with us, we're gonna make sure that you are fined, caged, maimed, or killed as a result of your resistance to the evil things that the government wants to do you on a daily basis. How is that right? It's not right. I wanna read some boring statistics here. But these are going to be quite shocking to you. There are over 7 million Americans on probation, on parole, and in jail right now as we speak. In 1953, at the height of the United so Soviet, Soviet Repu uh, uh, of the USSR, Stalin's gulags, which had both citizens who had committed crimes and citizens who had committed political crimes, was at 1.6 million. We are at nearly four times the amount of the height of the Soviet terror in 1953 with our incarceration, parole, and probation. That's horrific. As a matter of fact, here's what, what else is interesting when we look at the trend line. U.S. incarceration rates between 1880 and 1970 range from 100 to 200 per 100,000. In 1980, it was 220 per 100,000. In 1990, 458. In 2000, 683. And the last statistics available are for 2008, in which it was 753. And by the way, we rank at the top for incarcerating human beings in cages on planet Earth. We do. Not Russia, not China, not Cuba, not the communist bad boys, or the socialist shit pits all around planet Earth. We do. Now why is that? Well, I'll give you a big reason why. It's because when we look at state statistics, we discover that more than 50% of the people that are incarcerated and caged in the states, not federal, but in the states, are there for violent purposes. Now, 55 to 60%, depending on the statistics you look, in, federal prison, in the federal prison system 
are there for, can you guys guess? Drugs. Drugs. You know what they're in there for? They're in there because they dare to alter their own consciousness without seeking the permission of another human being, especially one in authority. And they're there because they took the time to imbibe in substances that the Creator put on this earth to grow naturally. Yep. Now what the hell's up with that? And why in the world do we allow people again and again to trample on us in this fashion? Because does anybody here drink alcohol? Yes. Oh. I think there's some who do. Does anybody here smoke cigarettes? I think they're nasty. But you know what? I would never take away your ability to reduce your lifespan by 15 to 20 years. As a matter of fact, it might benefit me in the long run. Same goes for alcohol. But when it comes to all the other drugs, why are they illegal? You'll see that with the three strikes you're outlaws, with the drug war starting to escalate after the creation of Nixon's DEA in 1972, all of a sudden we have an exponential increase in the ability to incarcerate human beings in the United States. And I hear again and again where people say, as I said earlier, well, the rank and file cops, they're not responsible for that. The hell they're not. If they have a moral compass and they have the means, like Sheriff Matt clearly does, to stand up and say, you know what? What my rank and file colleagues are doing is dead wrong. As a matter of fact, not only is it dead wrong, it is injurious to the future of my nation. And I'm going to stand athwart history and I'm going to say enough is enough. I'm not going to enforce bad laws because guess what? Bad laws were meant to be broken. Yes. In 1775, April 19th, when we started our divorce from the United Kingdom, we didn't ask the king's permission. He came to us and he saw us on Lexington Green and he said, stand back, ye rebels, ye vermin, ye people who don't want to be part of the United Kingdom. And what did we respond with? We said, okay, okay, we're going to back off. I like to agree. But then what happened? We had folks die there. They were British at the time, by the way, but they died there. The British had quite a hard time in the next 48 hours making it back to Boston because they had struck the match. And we need to strike the match sometime ourselves. We need to realize that the time has come for all of you to stand up because you owe it to your children and grandchildren. Not only for the debt and the deficit that was mentioned earlier, but for the fact that what happened to this family visited upon us locally in Tucson is a monstrosity. There is no way to make excuses for it and come out right. In the end, what this means is that every one of us becomes a collaborator and this evil that we call the drug war, and this evil that we call the criminal justice system in the United States. And we've got to stand up and say enough is enough. I recently had the misfortune of getting one of my teenage children embroiled in the criminal justice system. I had never been there before in that capacity. Guess what I discovered, aside from the defense attorney that I paid for out of my own pocket because of the detritus and intellectual flotsam that they put into the government public defender office, Good God, the only reason those people are alive is because breathing is an involuntary function. He, my defense attorney, paid out of my wallet, was the only non-government employee in that courtroom. Is there a conflict of interest there? Yeah. Is there a conflict of interest when rogue government employees, their bailiffs, their cops, and all of their functionaries and apparatchiks are there? Are they ever going to do something that is going to be injurious to their job or the power of the state expanding? They cannot, because it would defy the way human relationships work. In the end, what we have to do is we have to realize that what happened to this family happens every day. And it's gonna keep happening. It's gonna keep getting worse. And now, like I mentioned, you see that the number of people that we have incarcerated in the United States has reached such biblical proportions that they're gonna to have to increase taxes because no one out of jail is gonna be able to afford to keep up the jails. One out of every $14 in this nation goes to the maintenance of our prison systems. And what happens, by the way, in these prison systems, when somebody goes in there who is a nonviolent drug offender, he's caught up in the three strikes you're out law or the mandatory sentencing law, he's a sophomore in college, he gets caught with a gram of coke, and he goes into the hoopska for five years, is he gonna come out a better citizen or is that a graduate program for advanced criminology? Yeah. By the way, let me, let me make a distinction here too. That's advanced criminology in the private sector, not the criminology we see practiced in the public sector on a daily basis.
210 prosecutors have been caught for malfeasance in the past two years. 210. I think that Stewart can speak to prosecutor, prosecutorial zealotry and neglect in this country has reached epic proportions. But this is 210 of the thousands of prosecutors that are out there who have been picked on and said, you know what, these guys have done such egregious and outrageous things, whether it's sending the wrong people to death row or collaborating on bad evidence, whatever the case may be, you guys can read the headlines and figure that out. How many of those do you suppose have actually faced serious discipline? Zero. Zero. One. One. What does that tell you about that conflict of interest? It tells you that until we strike the root, until we find a way to rip asunder this entire concept that the initiation of force by the government and the government's ability to use us as mere puppets and mere cattle in a tax jurisdiction must end. Because if it doesn't, our servitude isn't going to get any better. It's going to get worse and more severe. Thank you. On the driveway, man. Back up! Get him out! 